Molly and I talk often about, you know, I just want to work. But as you know, being an actor, it's, it's not always up to you. But also, what if it was? You're listening to Inside Acting, a podcast dedicated to demystifying the inner and the outer game of success in the entertainment industry. I'm Trevor Algott, and coming up in episode 294 today, I sit down for part one of my chat with actors Britt Harris and Molly Elizabeth Parker to talk all about their unique and really exciting international filmmaking project, Jump the Fence. They're making seven films with seven different filmmakers in seven countries in seven months. It is awesome. And in part one today, Britt and Molly share what sparked this idea, how they've moved forward through thick and thin to get not only the first film, but also the accompanying documentary about the making of that film in the can, and how and why they continue to choose for themselves the life of a working artist. Episode 294. Stay with us. Support for this episode of Inside Acting is brought to you in part by Rehearsal Pro, the current version of Rehearsal, the essential app for actors. It's available right now for your iOS device inside the iTunes App Store. So if you want to learn your lines, if you want to be off book confidently and quickly for your auditions, if you want to explore your character, make stronger choices and do a whole lot of other cool stuff, go to rehearsal.pro slash IAP right now to learn all about all the kick-ass features in this newest version of Rehearsal, the groundbreaking app for your iPhone or iPad or your iPod Touch, designed by actors for actors. Again, that's rehearsal.pro slash IAP. So hey everybody, welcome to episode 294 of this here show called Inside Acting. Uh, Trev here. AJ is traveling in España as I record this, and he did send in a pre-recorded segment, a very brief pre-recorded segment that I'm going to play uh, in just a second. But he will be live back with us next week for episode 295. Before I get to AJ's segment, just want to give a big, warm uh, welcome, shout out, hug to Brittany Horn, who just joined us uh, as a monthly contributing member. Brittany, thank you so very much for your support. And of course, Working Wednesday, uh, if you're working on something this coming Wednesday, whether it's a play or a script or you're just writing or you're just hanging out, whatever you're doing on Wednesday, snap a photo of it, tell us about it, throw it up on Twitter with the hashtag Working Wednesday. And we'll be sure to retweet it to our followers and just kind of help build the community uh, and really just kind of get a nice picture for all the various things that we do as actors, as creative people uh, from day to day, especially on Wednesdays. So let's hear uh, quickly from AJ. It's a really short little segment that he recorded in Spain and emailed over to me this morning, but um, it's a nice reminder. So um, yeah, here's what AJ has to share from España. Hola de España a todos. Estos uh, AJ, I am traveling as uh, was previously discussed on the podcast. Jasmine and I are um, just going through Spain because we found cheap tickets. That is the beginning, middle, and end of that story. Um, I mentioned Scott's cheap flights as one of my picks of the week um, a few episodes. Well, it's probably a couple months ago now. Um, and that's how we did it. So I would definitely recommend that again. We've had an amazing time. More stories to come later. I'm still traveling though. So, uh, just wanted to do a quick update and, uh, and not, you know, spend too much time not being present to the, the travel itself, which I have found or was reminded of when I got here. And as we've been traveling that, that's one of the most important things is just being present. So, uh, got some other exciting news that I will share in a future episode, but for now, just wanted to check in and share that big lesson in terms of travel. And I'm excited to get back to our regularly scheduled programming once I am back in the States. 
See you then. Adios. Presence, 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 awareness, mindfulness, uh, intentional directing of your energy to the present moment. So powerful and so important, especially the deeper into mobile technology we get in our culture. You know, it was funny. It was, I was reading some, I don't know, op-ed piece and on some website not too long ago. And the author was joking about how somebody said to him like, oh man, you know, with all this artificial intelligence technology, isn't it crazy? Like the machines are going to, they're going to take over pretty soon. They're going to win. And the, the author just kind of like turned to his friend and was like, dude, are you kidding me? Look around. The machines have already won. And then he kind of went on to describe, you know, what he sees when he looks around in a restaurant or at a train station or just walking down the sidewalk. You just, every single free moment that people seem to have these days, that phone comes right out of the pocket without them even thinking about it. And they're just scrolling through some feed. They're just filling up their brain, filling up that dead space with some sort of noise rather than just being in their environment and soaking in the nutrients of that place and just being being present being aware that's that's being you know it's the practice of being a human i don't know i don't want to sound like a cranky old man here but it, it's something that I'm, I'm feeling more and more strongly about um the more uh i practice disconnecting from my devices and also the more i look around and and can't find anybody to make eye contact with in my day to day because uh they're the phone the almighty iphone or android phone or whatever that screen reigns supreme these days so more power to you aj awareness presence absolutely, freaking lootly man on my end i do have one small piece of news uh, i updated my character and animation voiceover demo. This is something that I do from time to time as sort of a side business. I help actors flesh out their character and animation voiceover demos for their portfolios uh, if they would like to do that. It's not something I recommend uh, actors invest their money in right off the bat when they're getting started with voiceover. I think there's wiser places to put money, uh, especially as you're building your portfolio. But if you, uh, you know, you have a nice portfolio going and you want to sort of make sure you have that, that part of, uh, of your skill set represented. That's something that I do. And uh, it had been a long time since I had updated my own. And if you'd like to listen to it, uh, you can find it on my Twitter feed. I, I threw up a thing on my Instagram as well. And uh, I'll put a link in the show notes if you'd like to give it a listen. It's only about a minute. There's like 12 spots on there. And they are a combination of work I've done in the past, auditions I've done in the past that I just fleshed out with sound effects and music, and then a couple spots that I just sort of put together myself. There were funny voices I caught myself doing when I was like talking to my friend's cat or something like that. Uh, you'll be able to hear exactly which one that is when you listen to the demo. <laughs> anyway, check it out if you'd like. A uh, link to uh, my updated demo is on the website. So that does it for this first segment of the podcast. Uh, before we toss it over to past me, talking to Britt and Molly, uh, we do want to give a quick shout out to VOTogogo.com. Guys, this is where I've learned just about everything I know about voiceover, and I cannot recommend it highly enough. VOTogogo.com is the award-winning voiceover training system and the winner of Backstage's Reader's Choice Award for Best Voiceover Training four years in a row, four consecutive years, it was voted best voiceover training by the readers of Backstage. If you want to see what that's all about, you can go to vo2gogo.com slash start and access a free getting started in voiceover online class. It'll give you everything you need to know about how to start adding voiceover to your acting portfolio. That's vo, the number two, gogo.com slash start. And with that, let's talk to Britt Harris and Molly Elizabeth Parker, creators of Jump the Fence, a very cool film project. And uh, I think you guys are going to enjoy this, this interview a lot. If you're not sort of itching to get out there and start making your own content and being ambitious and just getting it done after you listen to this, listen to it again. <laughs> All right. Enjoy, guys. I'll catch you on the other side.
Hey everybody, this is Trev, and I'm really, really stoked to be sitting down with Britt Harris and Molly Parker, both actors and filmmakers who are working on a really cool project called Jump the Fence. And I, I kind of want to like tease it here and tell you all about it before we start actually talking, but I think I'm just going to let it just sort of unfold naturally and, and have them tell us all about it. So Britt and Molly, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. Hey. Of course. Hi. Thanks for having us. For having us on. I also want to just quickly preface that um, there is a a third person that you guys work with, Lacey, who uh, is not joining us on this interview. Is that is that correct? Um, Yes, she hasn't worked with us yet. Um, The idea is that there are three of us who are available to act in these films, and sometimes it will be Britt and I. Sometimes it will be Lacey and I. Um, There may be one where it's Britt and Lacey. Um, We've talked about me in the last film that we do, stepping out and working as an assistant director and having Lacey and Britt act. Very cool. In that film. So you guys are switching up roles quite a bit uh, throughout this process. Sometimes you'll be in front of the camera and sometimes you'll be behind the camera. Yeah. Um, So we shot the first episode in Brazil and um, I'm directing the the documentary aspect of jump the fence. So it was, there's a little bit of going back and forth of, you know, we're acting in a film, but we're also being conscious of what's happening, um, on the other side, as far as the documentary goes. Yeah. And I feel like I should uh, quickly give a little tagline for what the project is because there is so much going on. I was just going to say, uh, let's, let's go ahead and just describe what it is that you guys are up to. Yes. So jump the fence is an international filmmaking project where we do, seven different films in seven different countries in seven months. Um, So that being said, the added level on that is that we're making um, this whole experience in each uh, country into an episodic documentary. So there will be seven episodes um, following our adventure and learning about how to make independent film in different countries around the world. That is so cool. And you've got seven different directors from each of these countries as well you're working with. That's right. Now, how did yes. you, I, 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 there's so much I want to talk about. And a lot of this was sort of sketched out on uh, your blog on the website, which is jumpthefence.org, I believe, if people want to check that out. And you also had a Seed and Spark campaign that I think was successfully funded. Yeah. Yes, yes it was. That's how we did it. The first episode. So this this idea is amazing. How did this come up? Like, where did this come from? And then what what made you realize? Yes, this is something we can actually do. We have the contacts. We have the resources. We have the willpower. Where did this all start? So this all started. Britt and I acted in a film together, Birds of Neptune, directed by Stephen Richter, um, here in Portland, Oregon, which is where I still live. Um, And that film ended up going to several different festivals. The first one, we had our world premiere at Slamdance, um, which runs with Sundance in Park City, Utah. Um, And at that festival, we met tons of different directors that we got to see their films and then meet them afterwards and met just a ton of people that we wanted to work with. And then after the festival was over, we ended up stuck in the airport together for like 12 hours. So we're sitting around thinking about traveling and how much we'd like to travel and talking about all of these people that we met and how much we'd like to work with them. Um, I think we said probably 20 times, like, I just want to make movies with my friends. Um, And then we had the idea of like, you know, we met all of these international people. What if we were to go and travel to where they live and make films with them? And then we thought, well, that would be really interesting. What if, you know, we could combine our love for film with our love for travel and go to all these different places and wouldn't that be interesting to do them kind of back to back and then that would be a really interesting journey like I bet other people would want to see um what that's like and working with all of these different people um and every film set is interesting things go wrong constantly um a lot of problem solving a lot of creativity, a lot of egos flying around. And the whole thing is very compelling to me. So we thought we could make, you know, each episode would be, we go to a film, we get to show, we go to a country and get to show how that filmmaker works and their creative process. Um, they're all independent filmmakers. So like, how are they getting funding? 
who are the people that they're working with and what is their process like? These people that you met at Slam Dance, are these the people you reached out to in, in, their, in their various countries and said, hey, we're doing this thing. Are you on board? Yeah, absolutely. One of them, Jim Lounsbury Britt, met at the Arizona International Film Festival. But all of the other directors, we either met at Slam Dance or once once we got this idea rolling, I started watching some films that I had missed at the festival and reached out to other people in other countries. Um, Eleanor, I believe you pronounce her name, Nechaima. Um, she is in Israel and she didn't attend the festival, but I ended up watching her film afterwards and she is a part of this project. We started talking and Skyping together um, and developing um, ideas that way. So yeah, they're all from connections that we made at the film festivals. God, that is so cool. And what, what, um, I mean, obviously there are a lot of obstacles that come with something as ambitious as seven films in seven countries in seven months. Was it difficult to pitch these directors or were they immediately like, Hey, that sounds cool. I'll, I'll be happy to do my part. It was kind of hit and miss. I mean, it's, it's a lot to ask of somebody of like, Hey, we loved your work. Do you want to write a movie for, <laughs> for us? to be in and like we'll show up and do it um some people were like yeah that's a really cool idea i'm in and some people were crazy good luck i don't want to have anything to do with this um our goal was to have we wanted to go to 12 countries and just do like one year we take off um and then come back in a year and just spend one month in each country we ended up there was a while when we had 10 and we were like hey that's really good we're probably going to need rest so we'll take like two months of rest in yeah. between. And then, you know, as things went on, people's schedules changed and we ended up with seven. And that seems like a really good, good number to me. We're both really happy with that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Especially after having one under our belts, I realized like, I don't know if I'm built to do this 12 times in a row. Like, I know it's, it's amazing, but oh my God, like. I'm sure a lot of people listening to this podcast know firsthand what it's like to be on a film set for 12 hours or maybe more a day and how tiring that is, how amazing it is. But also like the thing about this project that's amazing and challenging is you're not going home at the end of the day. Like you're far away from home. In addition to doing the job you are supposed to do in the film, in our case, uh, acting, we're taking on other roles as well because we are also producing this overarching project of documenting everything. So it's like we're communicating with our personal film crew who we brought, who we brought, trying to map out um, pot potential things we want to hit, like um, with our experience there, make sure it's documented. At the same time, in this last leg, we are trying to get um, our contributor gifts figured out and sorted from our Seed and Spark campaign. Like it was crazy. It was crazy. But yeah, not amazing. to mention speaking Portuguese, right? Because uh, <laughs> like, let's, let just that in forget. itself. Wow. Now, are these seven films in seven countries in seven months, are these consecutive seven months? Or is this more like a seven months total with a little bit of time here and there for various production uh, responsibilities? The original plan was to do it in a row. But what we realized is to get the funding that we need, it's it was it would be impossible to get the funding before having a proof of concept. So essentially what we did for episode one is we crowdfunded it, are using episode one as a proof of concept to um, obtain the rest of the funding we need for the last six. And that would determine our scheduling. Wow. And the funding includes uh, travel, lodging. Are you compensating the filmmakers? I mean, how, how's that all working out? Um, they are all funding their own films as if it's going on without us and we just show up as free actors who are working on it. So they're their own all of the filmmakers are funding their own projects in whatever way that they do that individually. Wow, we are, okay. we are, um, funding our traveling crew, Britt, me and our cinematographer, Ian Stout, um, to come with us. And then what we did last time is we hired a local sound person who is great and so <laughs> nice to have somebody who can speak the language and help us in that way. Um, so yeah, it's like food and lodging. We, I wouldn't say we paid ourselves. We paid our rents while we were gone, so we still had apartments to come home to when we got back. Um, That's a good way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, and are these feature-length films, or are these shorts, or, or what are we looking at in terms of um, what each project is? It's all over the place. Um, 
so this last one that we shot in Brazil, um, Haise's Roots, um, was intended to be a feature film. And he is editing right now. Um, and the intention is for that one to be a feature film. It may end up being shorter than that. Um, we are not 100% sure. Um, Jim Lounsbury has expressed that he would like to do, make a feature film with us. And he's from other Australia. Ones. Yep. Um, we're going to be w- working with Sasha Grinstein in China, and he's doing a sort of like an experimental short piece. So it's really like whatever is exciting to that director, whatever kind of film they make, it's it's up to them what they want to do. Yeah, and also because we have like a longer timeline than we thought now and the exact details of the rest of the scheduling are still unfolding, it allows these directors to have more time in development with their pieces, which I actually think is great because before we were trying to get everyone to give us a log line and have everything ready as airtight as it could be. But now I just feel like it's it allows more time to take joy in the pre-production of all these projects that our friends are graciously um, financing themselves. So I want them to be able to be able to have the time to really make a movie that they want to make and have the time to flesh it out, uh, the way they can. So I think that is a blessing in disguise, but I think we, Molly, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think as of now, at least three of the seven projects are feature films. Um, I believe that's Greece, correct, yeah. Australia and Brazil. Yeah. But we'll see how the rest shakes out. As of now, the rest are going to be, uh, shorts. Wow. Greece, Australia, and Brazil. And, and the other four, I mean, I know, I know one you're shooting domestically here in the States. Uh, what are the other three? That's right. Um, so the one domestically is in Portland, Oregon, in the U.S., China, um, Norway, and Israel. Wow. And is that is, all of them? Yeah. Is uh, Greece next? I don't um, know where I read that or saw that. Um, that's probably just the way that we arbitrarily threw up the kind of countries up on our website, but, um, next, next should be Israel. Um, that's what we're shooting for. And it, I mean, it depends. They're all raising money as well. So it depends when we get our money, when they get their money, we've really opened it up. So like, we'll be there for a month, but we have to see when all of that works out. And this is when we first came up with the idea. I mean, neither one of us had ever done anything like this or initiated a film project in any sense. So like understanding what it takes to, to get that money together and to get all your ducks in a row and write a budget and find a team of people who can help. And like all of this stuff we were totally ignorant about. So we've learned so much um, throughout this process. Yeah. It's been an incredible learning experience. Yeah. Yeah. I bet. I I was going to ask what kind of um, creative input you have because it, it sounds to me and correct me if, if I'm kind of misunderstanding, but it sounds to me like you basically contacted these filmmakers and said, I love your stuff. I want to work with you. Do, do you have a, I'm, I'm going to, we're going to do this thing. Do you have a project that could possibly feature, uh, an actress or two that look, walk, talk and sound like us? Um, and then, and then in return, you can, you know, we'll help sort of publicize your project and your work and we'll help out with production. Is that kind of the, the gist? Yeah. Yeah. More or less. I think, uh, except maybe with the exception of Eleanor from Israel, everyone who's working on the project with us, we had met in person and became close to over a pretty short period of time, but we knew when we met and hung out with these people and started these relationships that we knew we wanted to work with them and would work well together. And we kind of had informal talks with each of these people about working on something eventually. And as the pieces started coming together with Molly and I, uh, realizing we wanted to do a project of this scale, we thought, Oh, Oh, maybe this is how it fits together. And an added bonus of that is these filmmakers, almost all of them are friends because they had met where we met at slam dance or at these other festivals. Um, and actually a number of festivals we went to after slam dance, um, those same directors, many of them were featured in other festivals as well. So we were like already like picking up where we left off in different places in the country or different places in the world and seeing them again. It was kind of a surreal and fun thing. Like it just felt like the fates can allow you to see certain people again that you may not ever have seen, but your art has brought you together and keeps bringing you together. So why can't we do it again? Molly and I talk often about, you know, I just want to work. 
but as you know, being an actor, it's, it's not always up to you, but also what if it was, <laughs> we don't want to keep waiting for someone to give us a job. And I mean, Yes, we learned a lot. There were so many things we didn't know, but we never thought it would be easy. And I think it just took us saying, you know what? This is going to be so fucking hard, but it's going to be amazing. And who's ever done this before? Let's do it. And everyone said yes. And the people, well, not everyone. Some people, as Molly said before, elected not to, to work on the project. But the people that did, they said yes. And that was such a gift and such a powerful thing. Like, I want to honor that yes and make sure that we we make this happen. So that's been a driving force for, for us. Yeah. What a great sort of school to put yourself through. I, I, I love that. And, and Molly, Molly, uh, I, I just want to, one of the articles um, that I found sort of by following the links via your website and one of the articles you I, I highlighted this quote because I just thought it was, it just speaks to everything that we're about on the podcast, but also it just speaks to the sort of larger um, sort of thing that's possible for artists these days. So Molly, you said actors are coached to work hard, prepare and wait to be in the right room at the right time to be chosen for a role that suits them. I'm ready to work. I refuse to wait for permission to do my job. And I just, I just <laughs> yeah. wanted to share that here because I think that's so beautifully put. I refuse to wait for permission to do my job. Yeah, we talk about that all all the time because it is frustrating to go on auditions. You need your headshots. You like, hopefully, you get an agent. You like auditions, auditions, and half the time it's for stuff you don't even care about or aren't like artistically interested in. And you're supposed to be grateful for the opportunity to use your creative energy to put into someone else's work. That's a good way. That's a good way to put it. It can be demeaning even sometimes. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And that's where the title, um, jump the fence comes from is like making your own opportunities. This is us. Um, this is us creating our own work for ourselves with people that we know that we want to work with people that other artists that we respect. When I was in acting class, um, I had this great teacher, Devin Allen, um, in college, and she told me a story about a group of actors who wanted to work together. Um, they knew they wanted to work together, and they formed a group and rented a space and chose a play that they wanted to do together and cast themselves in whatever roles they thought was right and all agreed on it. And then they aud brought in directors and auditioned directors and had them <laughs> direct them in like a few different scenes and tried out different people and saw how they worked together. And so they were casting directors from the other side. And I just thought that was really interesting in that idea of thinking of just thinking of it differently where you don't have to wait to be chosen. You can choose yourself. Hmm. Yeah. Just shifting your perspective. Like one of the big obstacles mentally for me in getting this project going is I thought, well, I'm not a filmmaker. I'm an actor, but I can be a film. What does filmmaker mean? I'm making a film. I can do that. I can produce, I can learn on the job. You know, um, I think being stuck in these labels are so limiting, like kind of what, what Molly was just saying about, like, this is the way you're supposed to do it. You're supposed to go to the audition, have your headshot ready, like hope they choose you. But like, what if not? What if being an actor, like it's more, you don't have to just stay in that narrow lane. So I think once I got over some of the mental blocks of like, yes, why not me? Why not us? Why not this? Uh, like who's really actually stopping us from doing this except my own willpower or uh, mental story I tell myself. And I want to try to apply that, you know, to my whole career because yeah. I think it's easy to default into like, oh, I have an audition tomorrow. Okay, okay. Uh, all right. Uh, do I look okay? I'm at book. Uh, I just really want this. Like I, I want to get out of that story. I want to be able to joyfully do this work, whether it's on someone else's time and terms or whether it's on my terms. In, and you and are, just, and you're doing it. It's like Britt ha has been working with her other friend, um, wonderful lady, Danny Larson, and they have a blog together, Two Evil Actors, um, and they've been producing these short little <laughs> skit comedy videos that are great, and just like getting together, writing something. The last one was this hilarious song what's it called girl love girl love yeah it's hilarious it's and like it's an 80s like 90s had. bonnie taylor spinoff oh my god yeah where can people find that 
You can find it on YouTube. You can search Two Evil Actors. We have a channel there. Uh, we also have a website, which is twoevilactors.com. Thanks, Molly. That was so nice of you to plug that. Yeah, well, I just love what you guys are doing because you love each other and want to work and you're funny and you just like <laughs> obviously sat down and wrote this thing together and then produced it. And like the production quality is great. And, you know, that's something you would be really happy to get cast in. If you were out auditioning for something, you know, this is this is a really great segue because I'm always really fascinated to hear what it is that brings people into this lifestyle, really. I mean, uh, Britt, we were talking before we started recording and you were like, yeah, I'm in my car. I'm between jobs, you know, just sort of making it work, improvising, like figuring it out. And and you guys said earlier, like, yeah, like we just we fundraised so we could make sure that we had apartments to come home to once we're done filming these projects. So Clearly, like nobody's making millions and millions of dollars off this idea yet. And, and, and also what you're talking about is, is a lot of um, potential headaches and hurdles and obstacles and frustration. And it would be so much easier to just go get a degree in real estate and start, you know, selling shopping malls and make a ton of money and have your kids and your house. And like so many people. And that's great. And I know a lot of people that do that and are very happy. And that's fantastic. I know I could never do that. But sometimes I have a hard time putting language around why I could never do that kind of thing and why I commit myself constantly every day to this journey, this this artist life journey. So for you guys, why? Why are you actors? Why are you doing this? What is, what is what keeps you moving forward every single day and not throwing in the towel? <laughs> oh, Trevor, I do have to tell you, I lived a previous life that I think is worth mentioning. I used to be a public accountant. I worked for Deloitte and Touche, which is one of the biggest accounting firms yeah, in the world. Yeah. And I, I kind of, that was in my early twenties. And I like, I quit cold turkey one day and I've been doing what I'm doing now since, but it's weird because like, I think as kids, we all know what we want to do. We spend our whole adult life trying to get back to that place, you know? And in college, I studied theater and accounting and ended up pursuing accounting because I didn't think, you know, acting was a legitimate career or that had been told to me too many times. It's just uh, like some force pulling me. Like, it is an active choice because I love it, but like, I can't do, I've tried to do those other lives and it doesn't work. Like... It's like I'm a cat and you're trying to put me in the bathtub. Like, I will be like, no, 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 no. And I, and I like, really forced myself to do it. Like, I thought, I thought, you know, that's what you're supposed to do. And, and for me, it's not. It's not at all. I got two degrees at the same time. I, I got a degree in accounting and I also went to acting school. And I got a bachelor's in, uh, in of arts and theater performance. And I think it was, you know, family pressure and, and all that where I, you know, I chose, I chose quote unquote accounting out of school, but yeah, I don't know. It's, it's weird. It's weird to think I did that once, but I did. And it was weird. <laughs> it was weird. How, how long did you, how, how long did you last at the, uh, at the accounting job before you were like, I can't dig this uh, anymore. Like I gotta go year. be an actress. <laughs> but I mean, I was taking my CPA exam. I had two of the four sections pass, which is really hard exam. I was doing the whole thing. And like after I left the super corporate job, I actually had a few years where I was weaning myself off of corporate work. So I would take like private accounting jobs or like smaller accounting jobs because I was too afraid to like really say goodbye to that world. But it just made me so unhappy. I was good at it, but that doesn't mean you should do something if you're not good at it. Uh, but I, I think it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess I was still trying to find myself as we often do in our early 20s, but I've, the through line in my life has always been creating things. And for me, that's been acting and it's been music and everything I do now. I just try to, I, I just need to try to find it, find as much time as possible to be doing both those things. So I, however my life arra- arranges around that I'm fine with like currently I, I am a tutor, which I love because I love school and it's fun to work with kids and allows me flexibility as well. So that's kind of my side hustle while I get to have the space and sanity to create things that I've been wanting to create like forever. So I feel like I've finally gotten into the sweet spot and claimed um, my identity as as an artist and as a self-employed person. Because for a long time, that was hard for me to get behind. I just had some weird stigma around it, I guess. But it feels amazing and empowering now. Awesome. Wow. 
Uh, Molly, how about you? What's, uh, wh- why are you doing what you're doing? <laughs> um, I never took a corporate job. I knew I wanted to act when I was a little kid. Um, first time I saw a play blew my mind and I just have been like tunnel vision focused on it since then. And it's just like, I said, when I was a kid, I want to be an actor. I have a really supportive family and it's just like, that's what I'm doing. And I, the reason I keep doing it just comes down to like what makes me feel the most alive. Like I love to create and like I have, I've been working in restaurants for, you know, since my very first job I'm bartending now, but I use my free time to create because that's what makes me happy. That's what makes me a sane person. That's what makes me feel on top of the world. So, I mean, I do all kinds of different things. I write, I, you know, I sing a lot. I play music. I, I draw like, but acting has always been the thing that like resonates with me the most (laughs) when I'm really in it. And I really believe it. And I'm really feeling these real raw emotions that aren't mine and that that's created. It just, I feel like I'm vibrating. It's, it's the thing. So, so I don't mind going to work. And I mean, my job is to get my neighborhood drunk every night, you know, like, (laughs) I hope I don't have to do that. It's such a noble thing. Somebody has to do that. That's right. All right, guys, welcome back. Hope you enjoyed part one of my chat with Britt Harris and Molly Elizabeth Parker. One of the really cool things about this podcast is that I have had the opportunity to not only learn about just a lot of cool shit that people are doing like this, but I've also then had an excuse or a reason to sit down and pick their brains a little bit about how they get it done. And then, of course, to be able to share it with uh, the larger community is just a real honor and privilege. So I really hope you guys enjoyed part one as much as I did and uh, really looking forward to bringing you part two next week. So I didn't say this earlier, but we have a, a great list of questions queued up that uh, listeners have written in that we're excited to respond to uh, next starting next episode. Uh, so we are going to um, to respond to those, but I'm going to wait till AJ's back with us live to really dig into those. So picks of the week, and AJ wrote in with a pick of the week. I hadn't heard of this, and then I watched the trailer for it just before I started recording here, and it looks great. I added it to my uh, to do list too. That's how I get shit done. Even watching movies, I have to add this shit to my to-do list. Uh, I added it to my list so I could make sure to check it out this week. So uh, here is AJ's pick of the week. My pick of the week this week is a movie. Don't you just love airplane movies? Uh, Well, sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. You're kind of a captive audience. I guess you could change it to one of the other movies, but I find that I tend to have good luck with airplane movies. And uh, this is a film that I know has sort of come and gone. I mean, if I was watching it on an airplane, it's been at least a few months, right? But uh, Jasmine and I watched The Big Sick on the plane on the way over to Spain, and we really, really enjoyed it. It was really well done, well written, uh, heartfelt, uh, funny, and poignant. You know, they cover some, some really honest ground in that film. So if you have not seen it yet, I would definitely re- recommend checking it out. That's The Big Sick. Yeah, it looks great. And it's cool because every time I see a film like that that is, you know, sort of on the more indie side of things, I just get more and more inspiration for what um, my next project might look like. It's, you know, they say good artists copy or imitate and great artists just flat out steal. I saw a lot of stuff in that trailer that I'm like, ooh, I'm going to steal that. Oh, I'm going to steal this. And um, isn't that what we all do? My pick of the week this week is um, surprise, surprise, environmentally themed uh, it, it, I got an, an email from the National Resources Def- Defense Council a couple weeks ago. One of the, the people on their board, or maybe it was like, I don't know, it was, it was some, some major player in that uh, organization, made an, an Emmy award-winning film, a documentary called Sonic Sea, Sea as in ocean, Sonic Sea. 
and it, you can get it on Vimeo. You can stream it on demand on Vimeo, and and they gave me a, a discount code to like basically zero out, zero out the cost of streaming that. So instead of three bucks to stream it, you can stream it for free. It's a powerful documentary, man. I I, I shared about it in my most recent newsletter, and I, I talked about sort of why it really hit home for me, and it, it hit home for me for a couple reasons. Number one, because I'm just an animal lover, shameless animal lover. Never want to see any creature suffer especially animals who are largely helpless at the hands of humans. Secondly, um, I sort of, I'm an, you know, a buddy and environmentalist. I, I, the more and more I learn about the environment, the more uh, urgent our situation feels to me. And thirdly, uh, I'm a sort of a lifelong swimmer. Like the, the water has long been a place of solace and a sort of moving meditation for me. And so if you combine all those things together, uh, you get a film like Sonic Sea, which was, uh, at times difficult to watch, but I thought it really, I thought it was a really important film and it ended on a really hopeful note. So check it out. It's something that I hadn't thought about at all. I don't want to say anything more about it because I don't want to give anything away, but, um, I was, uh, moved and, uh, this whole new world, literally this whole new world is now, uh, on my spectrum, um, of just human activity and our impact on the environment and other animals and, it, it's it's an impressive piece of work. Check it out. Sonic Sea is the name of the documentary. Link to it on our website in the show notes. And then, of course, you can zero out that rental cost and watch it for free by using the promo code Sonic C S E E Sonic C Sonic S E E. We have a listener pick of the week as well. This comes to us from Tony. Tony just stumbled across, I'm quoting the email now, just stumbled across this story video by the Smithsonian from 2015. A student from the University of Minnesota composed a string quartet piece which corresponds to data that tracked climate temperature over the past 130 years. It's not acting related, though I know the topic of climate change has come up in the past and something I also feel very strongly about. So awesome, Tony. Rock on. Tony also says it's an oddly, hauntingly beautiful musical piece. I actually came across this story back in 2015 when it first came out. And a lot of artists are doing this. They're they're taking just this mountain of scientific evidence about how humans are, you know, impacting the environment and turning this data, which is really kind of terrifying, into artwork of some kind. And a few people have have taken this temperature data and transmuted it into music or musical pieces, either through uh, computer programs and algorithms, or they've just flat out like transposed it into music and then played that music. So this is pretty cool, the string quartet piece. There's a link to it on our website in the show notes for this episode. Check it out. So that's it for this episode of Inside Acting. Thanks for listening, guys. Episode 294, produced and hosted by me and AJ Meyer, Jen Levin, Gadali Gubrek, Deborah Smith, Grace Gordon, Fern Lim. They're our rock star team. Find them, love them, long time. They rock. Uh, I went ahead and edited and mixed the episode today and composed the theme and interview music. And if you'd like, you can sign up for our weekly email dispatch and listen to all of our episodes. We have 293 other episodes you can listen to for free all over at our website and or on Apple Podcasts. You can start at InsideActing.net to get the lowdown on all that. And you can also find us on social media there. Uh, And if you've got a minute, you can also find a link there to review us on iTunes. Reviewing us on iTunes, leaving us a positive review, review there really, really goes a long way. Big thanks to our sponsors, Rehearsal Pro and vo to go go And a big thanks to you guys, our listeners. On our website as well, you can subscribe to our weekly newsletter, get links to everything we've talked about in this and of every other episode. And if you'd like, you can also be like Brittany from earlier in the episode and support the continued production of the podcast with either a one-time, one-off, no-strings-attached financial contribution or via an ongoing contribution every month as part of our membership. You can cancel that at any time as well. Visit us at InsideActing.net to learn more and uh, show us a little bit of that uh, little bit of that love. That's it for episode 294 of IAP. Thank you for listening, guys. We'll see you next week. And in the meantime, don't wait. Don't wait.